The federal budget is coming up in the future, and it'll have a number of items that deal with the energy and climate space. And I'm going to talk to Dr. Bruce Lorry, who is the president of the Ivy Foundation and adjunct professor of at the School of Public Policy Studies at Queen's University. So welcome to the interview, Bruce. Thanks, Markham. Well, this is going to be very interesting because it's time now for the federal government to actually put real dollars into some of these programs they've been talking about, uh, especially around emissions reduction. Uh, so wh what are we looking at in the in the upcoming budget? Yeah, well, we we have a sense of what some of their priorities will be, um, which, you know, we're going to see more details at the end of this month in the something that's called the emissions reduction plan. And so I can only imagine that the budget will have to have things in it that will be supporting the, the announcements that essentially that they've already signaled that they're going to be making. And um, so the, so I think we're going to see across the board, if you look at the, you know, the makeup of emissions in different sectors, you know, we're going to see something very specifically around oil and gas. We'll see some things around um, zero emission vehicles for um, consumers. We'll see some things around um, uh, light and heavy duty vehicles and, and maybe some support there, um, uh, tr tax credits for carbon capture, and, um, and then probably some things with respect to industry, and that would be opportunities around steel, cement, and then, um, and then they have announced the commitment to a net zero electricity grid by 2035, so presumably there will be some support for how we do that. Well, let's talk about the, uh, the zero emission vehicle mandate. Uh, uh, so basically, they're going to mandate that a certain percentage of cars that, that are going to be sold in Canada, whatever that will be, and then it has to go up over time. And so we get to 100% by, by 2035. And there's other countries that have done this. Uh, any wrinkles that, that make this particularly Canadian? Because right now, only BC and Quebec really have uh, they have mandates yeah. and a supply of EVs. Yeah. So just to be clear, the, the electricity grid will be 2035. I think the ZEV mandate will probably extend beyond that in terms of reaching 100%. But um, yeah, you know, may, Quebec, BC, all kinds of European countries have already instituted ZEV mandates. Um, we see countries like Norway, uh, electric vehicle sales right now are 64% of all new sales. So We'll probably have people in Canada screaming it's impossible to, you know, get beyond 10% by 2030 when countries, uh, other countries are already far, far, far ahead of us. So, um, yeah, so we don't know the exact details, but that's exactly right. We're going to see uh, a percentage number of cars that must be, um, just to be clear, zero emission vehicles. Uh, so not, not only electric, but there aren't many other alternatives available these days um, by, by certain dates. and you know, maybe if, uh, yeah, yeah. And then, and then a, ultimately a phase out of the, of the sale of combustion engine vehicles. Well, let's talk about the carbon capture utilization storage tax credit. I mean, this has been coming for a little while now. And on the oil and gas side, I've, you know, I've written columns arguing that, that before the government commits to this in a big way, that in fact, there are some conditions should be attached. And one of them is their environmental liabilities. You know, they've got uh, 37 tailings ponds in the oil sands, all kinds of inactive and orphaned wells that aren't being cleaned up. I mean, it, there are some serious, serious uh, liabilities. And why? And and the and the and companies are incredibly profitable, and probably will be for the rest of this decade. Seems like now is a really good time to use that carrot of the tax credit to get them to do some of the other stuff they need to do. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Mark. I'm, I mean, quite frankly, the uh, um, the the orphan well issues and the cleanup issues, uh, you know, really are, I think, an embarrassment for the industry. At least uh, I, I would be. Um, and uh, and the fact that they've gotten away with it for so long is, I, I think, really outrageous. So um, I, I think conditions on this are absolutely critical. And um, uh, and at the same time, you know, as you as you're alluding to, you know, I think even today, oil prices just hit uh, uh, the highest since 2014 or something. So we know that the companies, through the you know the the, the reduction in prices really squeezed out a lot of efficiency, reduced a lot of costs. So, you know, they're now some of them profitable at 25 or $30 a barrel. We, we see oil up at close to $100 a barrel today. So there are there's just massive, massive amounts of money being made in Alberta. And um, you really have to wonder why they would need any sort of a tax credit, frankly, to uh, reduce their emissions. It is just to be clear, 
um, Markham, the reason why Canada's emissions are so much above the rest of the G7 in terms of, you know, our percent increases is because of oil and gas production related emissions. So um, uh, we've, we've known this for 20 years, virtually nothing has improved and this really is an opportunity for the government to take action. And it's, it's particularly, uh, I think, uh, uh, we need to move on it because the, the uh, federal government is also forecasting that uh, oil and oil production alone will go up 900,000 barrels a day by 2030. So if supply is going up, you need to cut your em emissions intensity per barrel quite a bit in order to begin yeah. to cut absolute emissions. So it's a real, it's a serious problem. Well, let's yeah. talk about uh, uh, medium and heavy duty trucks. I mean, California has been doing this. Some of them are you know, leading states have been have been doing this. What uh, might we see in Canada? Yeah, I'm I'm uh, kind of hoping that Canada is looking at the California model. Quite frankly, I mean, California really does lead North America and lead you know much of the world in 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 developing these kinds of policy tools that uh, that help create the markets for you know alternative vehicles, alternative fuels, and um, you know so what we'll likely see. In Canada, there's sort of a distinction between the medium, the medium vehicles, which will likely be electrified, and the long-haul freight vehicles, which you know right now I think will more likely be a hydrogen fuel cell. So anything that is going to be providing supports to build out the infrastructure for those, um, particularly I think on the hydrogen side, where Canada actually has a competitive advantage to get in the hydrogen fuel business, um, I'm hoping that we'll see uh, we'll see. Uh, uh, um, specific things that'll uh, help advance that. I, I recently sat on a U.S. Energy Association panel with uh, there were four uh, utility CEOs there. And I asked the question about, are they gonna use hydrogen for storage connected to renewables? All of them are going hard on that on that issue, yeah. and it would seem to be that Canada has you know the opportunity to help decarbonize its grid, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan using hydrogen. Yeah, and, and in fact, it ties back to the previous point on carbon capture tax credits. So if we, um, so one example is to um, have some kind of perhaps accelerated tax credit that would be for producing a clean fuel like hydrogen versus a tax credit that is uh, basically just gonna, you know, uh, extend the existing lifetime of the oil industry. So, uh, cause once you, once you uh, tie carbon capture to natural gas, then use the natural gas to produce um, hydrogen, then then you're getting uh, you know very significant emission reduction. So we've got that opportunity in Alberta, and then you look at places like Quebec with you know ab abundant amounts of uh, of electricity that overnight can be used to produce hydrogen through electrolysis. So I mean Canada is super well situated to be a major player in hydrogen, and um, I, I uh, you know I really think that's a big opportunity for the government. Well, let's talk about another area where they might invest some money, and that is uh, decarbonizing heavy industry like steel and cement. And I interviewed Dr. Chris Bataille, who's an economic modeler here a couple of weeks ago, and his point was that these industries are decarbonizing far, far faster than anybody had expected. And this seems to be, you know, a bit of an opportunity for Canada. Yeah, without question, I would agree, uh, agree entirely with Chris. It's it's. Uh, it's it's a it's one of those few areas where it's a good surprise. Um, I think we're seeing uh, the steel industry globally, and and I would frankly I would say the steel industry in Canada um, is is you know close to close to being at the level of some of some of their international peers in in recognizing the ability to decarbonize steel, and and that that is through you know a combination of electrification and using um, hydrogen in the steel making process. So. It's another opportunity to support hydrogen, but it's also, um, as you say, uh, some of the sectors that we assume are providing a, a bigger part of the solution, like electric vehicles, are actually far behind the rest of the world. Um, whereas, um, you know, with the exception of oil and gas, the other industrial sectors, as you mentioned, we have forestry, steel, cement, um, you know, are, uh, are, are showing significant uh, improvements. Well, let's talk about the last area, which is, uh, uh, this is a promise that the, the Prime Minister made, and that is uh, a net zero grid, power grid by 2035. And the challenge here isn't so much getting to 100% uh, clean energy, because we're already at 83%, thanks to hydro and nuclear and, and so on. It's to do it while the, the, the grid is growing. 
because mm -hmm. uh, again, back to Dr. Bataille, he says that you know Canada will need two or three times as much power as it currently consumes. So you not only have to decarbonize, but you also have to expand generation and transmission and distribution and all of those things. That's where the challenge seems to be. Will there be money for that, do you think? Yeah, I certainly hope so. Uh, I think that, I mean, I, and I couldn't agree more with that assessment. Uh, I worry a little bit that the government is overly focused on the uh, the remaining 17%, which quite frankly, in the scheme of things, of, you know, in terms of our getting to 100%, um, in the scheme of things, that's not really that difficult. And um, it's not really where, you know, where we need to be putting the bulk of our thinking. Um, it is, in fact, creating this modernized, um, more sophisticated, expanded and integrated grid. And um, I, I would, it would be great if we could see, uh, see some support um, not only just for the actual, you know, like the dollars needed to help build that, but the dollars needed to help think it through. You know, it's a, it's a big, big complex piece. And, um, and to be honest, I'm not sure we're seeing the kind of leadership out of the, uh, out of the utility and electricity sector that we need to uh, even envision what does a 2050 electricity grid look like and how do we get ourselves there? So it's, uh, it's and it's more than just, you know, building, power projects and transmission lines it's the it's the entire functioning of you know electricity systems so the software the oversight the market rules the, it's it's a big complex machine and um and we're not we're not nearly where other countries are at in terms of thinking this through well bruce thank you very much for this we'll uh, we'll watch the budget announcement later this month with bated breath see how accurate we were in terms of these observations thank you very much for this Great, thank you, Mark, my pleasure.